that's new. Did you hear that? Yeah. In fact, I had to click OK. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wow. Good evening, Bill. Good evening. Hi, Sandy. <laughs> um, I haven't spoken to you for ages. It seems so. Uh, welcome back on this very blustery evening here in Bournemouth in the UK. What's it like there in Brooklyn? Uh, it is 68 degrees and absolutely clear sky. So it's beautiful. Lovely. Well, this evening we're going to be talking about trials and tribulations. Um, and sometimes we come at these presentations and you do have a sense beforehand from me about what we're going to talk about. But tonight really is just straight out the bag. You've not seen this. You had a quick flick through the slides before we started. Yes. Um, any sense before we unleash? Wait, do, 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 I, do I get some sort of handicap on what I say based <laughs> upon the fact that I'm coming in this totally cold? Absolutely not. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Great. But do you want to give a sort of sense of the overview of what you perceive this to be about based on the title and then some of the things you've already had a glimpse of? Oh, I wouldn't dare to even try. <laughs> oh, Bill. Okay. So this evening, the selection of work is uh, all female in that each artist is a female artist. And each piece of work may be considered something that speaks to particular kind of female narratives, female concerns. And I used that phrase, female concerns, just before we started, just before we started recording. And you kind of bristled a bit at that. Do you want to... Say no, I didn't. I, 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 I was just asking for a, a definition and if there are concerns that are specifically male that would be called male concerns or if it's just these are people concerns that more affect women because I don't know, um, you know, more sexual crimes are against women and that, you know, I mean, the, the like statistical sort of stuff um, or, or if there's actually elements of female life that do not exist in men you know what I mean mm. and that's what we're talking about I think these things might sort of unfold themselves as we are talking through the images we've got yeah. um but I did want to start with Stella Vine um and this painting titled hi Paul can you come over it's from 2003 and I'm sure that most viewers will understand immediately that it is a portrait of um Diana, Princess of Wales. Yes, I was um, about to ask that. Yeah, and the reference Paul um, is to Paul Burrell, her butler. Mm -hmm. And again, for, for anybody unsure or hasn't heard about this kind of part of portion of uh, very recent British history, Paul Burrell as butler to Diana, perhaps there was some speculation that they also had quite an intimate relationship, perhaps an affair. And sadly, you all know that um, Diana died in a car accident in Paris. And th there's a lot of like loaded, um, loaded up stuff really about Diana, what she means to a British identity, what she means in terms of a monarchy, um, how she challenges perhaps stereotypes, how she challenges our sense of but our sense of identity as maybe royalists, maybe British, uh, whatever it is. Did she, did she mean a lot to you? No, truthfully. She never meant any, really never meant anything to me. I mean, it was sad when she died in the sense that, you know, somebody who was obviously had a really tough time with, you know, British press and yes, mm. all the rest of the stuff you were saying, but I never had any connection with her. I never felt like I knew her in any way. No, I didn't. But then, you know, I remember this is sort of just an aside, really. I, I had I was living in Bournemouth. I'd not long been in Bournemouth, actually. And my mum had come down to visit. And um, I was living in a, in a small apartment shared with one other person. I think we had been up late the night before drinking or something. Anyway, there was this furious racket very early in the morning. And it was my mum uh, who was beside herself with grief, um, having found out that Princess Diana had died and I remember bringing her into the flat and she was crying and she was really I mean grief properly grief stricken and I remember thinking to myself that you know as you said it was very sad that somebody had died 
but I couldn't, I couldn't fathom the depth of feeling that, you know, my mum would have for Princess Diana. I didn't really, it didn't occur to me that that should be a thing that I felt also. I I think in the British world, you could argue that if people have an identity of the crown and the royal family as like a defining aspect of being from the UK, therefore some one of them dying is a little bit like part of the country dying in some way. You know what I mean? I like that sort of transference game going on. Maybe, but I just never had any of that. Anyway, go ahead. No, but I think in terms of our title, and we have to keep coming back to our title really to contextualize this a little bit. Trials and tribulations, you know, you mentioned already, you know, Diana had a horrible time, really, uh, at the hands of the the press. She was at once idolized and in some ways kind of reviled. She was um, held up. sold more papers that day. She was held up. She was iconic. She is iconic. Um, And yet the way she was laid bare often was, was quite mean. Sure. And I think, you know, now in, in kind of current culture and we see the kind of the rise of um, quite a, a wave, I would say, of hatred for Meghan Markle, for example, um, and how Princes Harry and William both at different times have responded and reacted to press invasion, especially regarding their, their wives and partners who've, who've married into that royal family, into the royal fold. I think there's a lot of kind of reaction and tension between how a person is presented publicly and essentially um, taken to task, almost like a trial really for their actions, for their perhaps, perhaps indiscretions. Um, And this painting, uh, when it was first revealed was (laughs) <laughs> hated as much as it was celebrated um, it was questioned and torn apart in fact even Stella Vine herself perhaps at some point used the description of it being a bad painting uh, I mean Vine is a is a is a UK artist she works in okay. London she's from Northumberland I think originally um, she's part of the kind of stuckest art movement, um, a prolific painter, painter of celebrity and um, kind of that kind of quite satirical, cultural, wry humor, but always tinged with a kind of bitterness, something that's unpleasant in it. And I don't know if it's an unpleasantness that comes from Vine to as the viewer, or if it's uh, an observation of unpleasantness that's very subtle, maybe, mm-hmm. from a wider audience unseen by Vine, but felt through the presence of the, the avatar presence of these characters, these celebrity characters. Um, you know, when I look at this, and I don't know this painting, um, it is interesting to me that you have a person who couldn't be more well-known in many ways, right? Um, Who has a spotlight, a telescope, and a microscope all on her 24-7. Yeah. And yet, in this painting, and in real life to a large extent, uh, from everything that I've heard or read, um, she was very lonely, she was very alone, and, you know, there's this isolation of her I mean, from a nerdy art, even just, the, you know, the yellow of the dress and the blue of the background and all these, you know, corresponding colors and things. It's like she is, she is isolated and alone and, and calling for somebody to come be with her. Yeah. Even though probably most of the time, it's got to be a weird thing being watched all the time and yet feeling alone the whole time you know i mean she was probably alone very little of her life you know after she joined the 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 monarchy like actually not in a room with someone else you know Mm -hmm. busy powerful woman talking to people and press and 
writing books and doing deals and you know humanitarian organizations and all the rest of it. I mean, this was not a person who didn't have contact with other people. And yet there was probably, she could probably count on her one hand, the people she could actually trust. Well, you know, it's something I wrote down in my notes. As you know, I like to <laughs> write my prolific notes before we start. Yes, you do. Um, and I, I put trust here and I've circled it many times. And actually I put trust throughout this presentation for different reasons, but I think really, um, as you point out, purely visually, we've got you know, the primary colors, it's bold, it's garish. Um, even though it's a very kind of um, fluid, rough sketch really of a person, the yeah. fact is it is a lightness, but it's an alarming lightness. And I think what it does with the text is that it's obviously asking us, it's asking us to perhaps consider what we judge, what we judge, not just of a painting, but of a person in a painting, and especially this person, especially Diana. And I mean, Stella Vine's done lots of images of celebrities. She's been highly controversial. She's obviously, um, some viewers will know, another very famous subject of hers was Kate Moss, the model, um, especially after the, the scandal where um, Moss was filmed snorting cocaine in a toilet. And um, the painting is very similar to this, but of Kate Moss. And the text says, holy water cannot help you now, or something something like that. It's holy water cannot save you now, holy water cannot help you now. But there's a real sense of kind of bitterness in that. And well, I mean, look, the, the, the text are, is written in what looks like blood, right? You know, and blood dripping from blood her lips or something. Her lips, yeah. Yeah, is that like, is that her blood? Is it she ate somebody else? Like exactly, you know, what is this supposed to imply? What is she trying to say with all of this? I just wonder that, you know, any subject that we might encounter through painting, there's always an elevation of subject through painting because somebody's chosen to paint it or them. And because of that, in this case, um, the elevation of that person almost isn't required. She was already a princess. She was already in the public domain. She was already scrutinized and torn apart by a being public for all kinds of reasons. Um, we sit in judgment on what we see. And in a painting like this, we're sitting in kind of many different judging positions. We judge the painter for her skill or lack thereof. We judge the subject because of what we think we know through a series of judgments we may have made based on other people's judgments. And then we judge how the painting is received by others. There's always this- You're saying we shouldn't do these things? No, I'm just interested in, in, in us doing these things. Uh, okay. Okay, let me just, let me make one little statement though. It's, it, it's interesting that both you and I very much know who, you know, Diana is or was, and neither of us really care all that much. It is interesting to me in a society, especially the society you live in, where everyone says, oh, all these people, they care so much about Meghan Markle, they care so much about Diana. What percentage of the population really cares at all about Meghan Markle having a black parent or Diana sleeping with some other guy? Like, is, is that sort of a minority who is a loud minority who cares? A loud minority that cares, but I don't think I could underestimate how powerful and persuasive um, the royal family is here in the UK. Yeah, but but is it such that they actually are or is it that it sells papers and so the press does whatever they can to keep crazy stuff going? And, 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 and so what I'm saying is that I think in some ways you could argue that Stella Vine is in many ways just a next step of you know the, the Daily Mail here mm -hmm. trying to create controversy that's going to get her press. Mm -hmm. You know, by the way, little, uh, one little aside, what do you think about paintings with, with writing on them? Do you think that's a, 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 a cheap stunt or do you think it actually 
you know, is, is it, is it a, is it a shortcut and, and a crutch or is it useful? First, I'd like to say, I wonder what you would ask me about someone like Jim Goldberg, the photographer. Yeah. Or what you'd ask me about an artist like Shirin Nishat, where, or San Juan, where words or characters are written actually onto the body. Yeah. I would say always, by any means necessary to express that which must be expressed. I, th I think part of it is that I have a reaction to it in general because I am not a verbal person. Oh, really? Are you sure? I can talk a lot, but I do not <laughs> think or I am not a... I don't swirl every word in my mouth as I'm speaking or listening, like some people, some people <clears throat> do. And so... <laughs> so... It, to me, oftentimes when I see it as there's a visceral turnoff when people use words in paintings or even photographs, uh, to me, it, it, it feels, it feels like it's too literal. It doesn't leave enough to the imagination. Well, as you know, I mean, I like things that leave stuff to the imagination. Yeah. yeah, you put all the information and then still not make a decision where I'd like to have very well, minimal information and definitely make a decision. Sometimes I think we ought not to be so fussy about, um, I mean, this is a very, this is a huge area, but, you know, we ought not to be perhaps so fussy about what art really is. Sure. And, you know, in that sense, I have no problem with text-based art. Yeah. Um, but the inclusion of text with other forms of art, such as in painting or in photographs, where yeah. there's an element of maybe purism. And, and one might say, well, I would like to see just a photograph. Well, that just photograph doesn't need further qualification, yet the fact that it has some kind of further qualification maybe is simply uh, a part of it's actually part of the painted medium, part of yeah. the photographic medium it might not be produced in the same material way, but yeah, I don't have a problem with it. I mean, it's certain, it's certainly a personal, um, yeah, it's just, it's just something that sometimes hits me and it just, it feels like I'm being yelled at sometimes, not yelled, you know, I'd be in my direction. Ye yelling is being happening in my direction. I'm not being yelled at, but you know, it's, it's, it's like the painting is shouting when there's writing on it to me. And I'm more of a subtle kind of guy myself. But that's fine. Sorry, Tracy Emmons. Sorry. You threw us off our thread a little bit. Sorry. Back that's to trials and tribulations. Yeah, go ahead. I think really what I'm getting at Perhaps tonight is too clumsy a way for me to deliver this, but I did want to think about how women are on trial. <laughs> you know, in the public the domain. The artist or, or the subjects? Well, notice the women are subject and artist. Yeah. Across all the pieces we're going to look at. In this one, there's an element of, I guess, it's externalization. And also the fact that it's somebody so famous, you know, Vine doesn't know Diana, but she may feel or have felt as if she did know Diana because of her fame. Sure. In this one, there's a sense of, um, I don't mean reduction in any kind of negative way, but we're swept back up into an individual that is, um, dare I say it, commonplace, something that for some women would be highly accessible, even though secreted away into the, the box or the file that says stuff that we do in private that we don't want anybody to see. And that of course is what Emin excels at. She brings forward what is sometimes hidden, but nonetheless very real. And what I find so interesting about this work is how, again, how hated it is you know, this painting is hated. 
and, and listen to the word. I really am using the right word, hated. But, but, but is it hated because it was by a female artist or is it hated just because people don't like the subject matter, or don't like the art? I think a combination of all the things. I think the painting was hated because people felt it was a disgrace that such a painting ought to command any kind of attention at all. Yeah, it's, it's like piss Christ or something like that. Like the yeah, it was exploitative. Kind of uh, Sacrilegious, yeah. You know, all of that stuff. This also loathed. Um, I mean, quite recently, relatively recently, you know, Emin exhibited this work uh, or her work alongside Turner. My mm. goodness, that created a, a firestorm, a frenzied attack on Emin. Uh, you know, how dare she think that she can sit alongside one of the greatest painters the UK has ever produced? Well, actually, do you know what? Emin is one of the greatest living painters, in my opinion. Um, and though this is not a painting, obviously this is an installation. Um, there is something ironically about the subtlety of this that is so powerful. And I wonder if the power is not necessarily in the most obvious parts of this. Okay, can, can I ask you a question? Mm. Other than the pantyhose on the bed, what of this, other than the fact that you know it's by a female artist makes this feminine as opposed to just being my bed well again i'm going to come back to this phrase female concern now okay so what is the female concern well first of all i want to qualify it by saying you and i talk often about how context and what we know informs how we see sure and i do know this is by tracy emin and i do know now of course quite a lot about tracy emin um, I also know that in this bed, it's not just the, the tights and it's not just the fact that there is a kind of detritus of female stuff. I mean, there is, I think I used sanitary towel somewhere. Um, I know that it's a bed of her depression after a relationship broke down yeah um i know that it's a bed that is made to appear as if it is the bed of somebody suffering now other people read it as the bed of somebody who is slovenly or somebody who is to be cast out somebody who is other um and again is it a female bed well unavoidably yes I would say so. And that has nothing to do with um, the value judgments about its mess. But it has everything to do with those things included that may be in themselves like red flags to some viewers. Again, this that notion of like exploitation or salaciousness for the sake of it or something. Um, but actually, everything speaks about <laughs> suffering. It's a personal suffering to Tracy Emin, but it's also female suffering. See, uh, that distinction is the one that I can't quite get in. I mean, uh, yes, okay, there's use sanitary napkins, of course, that's a female thing. I look at this and see, you know, vodka bottles and cigarette cartons and a disheveled bed. And if you tell me this person just got out of a terrible relationship or you know, a, a relationship, a serious relationship that's broke up and they fell into this huge depression and funk, this is, this is a unisex situation to me. Yeah, there yeah. are lots of elements, of course, that are unis unisex. Yeah. And you know, you I, and I, I, again, off camera talk about this and we want to, I, I'm going to speak for both of us. I hope that is okay, Bill, but we obviously sure. we want to be extremely sensitive people listening and what they may feel about um, gender and privileges of gender, gender identity. Um, and of course, what we say is, is our opinion, yep. only our opinion. Um, the fact is that this bed belongs to somebody, yet it could belong to any of us 
you're right. Could belong to any of us. I, I'm just saying the pain that she feels is that specifically female in some way? No, and I don't think that was the point of the work. Yeah, I am putting okay. it here because I do want to discuss this idea that here is a female artist who exposes yep. her truth because she, she must express, she must express. She's compelled to express. See, I feel like it, that entire sentence you just said, take out, the, pro, take out the, the feminine pronouns and make it, this is an artist who must express their thing and it still works. Yes, I know, but the, further to that, what okay. I would say is that um, the backlash against this work well, was, there is misogyny in the world, especially when it comes was, to was so misogynistic. Sure. And I and I have to say, you know, um, Tracy Emin perpetually is in the dock. And and just as an aside, I haven't put it here, but again, some of you will know that um, Emin has been very very unwell this past year. Um, she had to have her bladder removed. She had a very aggressive. Oh tumor in her bladder and because she's Tracy Emin she's been in my opinion brave enough to share every single detail it seems with us about her experience of having major surgery of having a life-threatening disease of feeling the the lows as much as one could express those lows Sure. Um, and she made a photo diary of her of her body uh, throughout the entirety of her treatment. This is more recently. This is just last year. I mean, how many people have sought to shame her for sharing those images of her bare-breasted? Um, uh, uh, what's it called? Not a colostomy bag, a urostomy bag. Sure. Um, you know. She is bearing it all. Again, I speak almost every time now about this idea of generosity. I can't think of anything more generous of an artist than to share these profound um, and deeply personal aspects of their lives. Is that is part of that sort of the um, the, the the UK? Oh, we just don't talk about that kind of thing, dear. Kind of element, the sort of private life don't bear your private life no one wants to see it element or is it specifically well, maybe, about her being a woman i don't know it's so puzzling because you know this country uh um again it's hugely generalistic but there is such an appetite for reality television for example well that is that is the funny absurdity of it all right is that is you know absurd. you both want people to, to to be private but you also want to get in everyone's business and watch big brother or whatever right this is yeah, um, so I, I, when, I've never know, I've never understood any of it, so it's right over my head. But sorry, didn't mean. So, to so when a woman, you know, shows up, like Emin has shown up, she is a beacon, really. I think she's a beacon, and I think also just want to mention, you know, this is an installation. It's been bought recently for something like two hundred and fifty million pounds. No, no, I'm talking rubbish. It's 2.5 million pounds. Um, it was estimated to sell for about 800 grand, I think. And it surpassed that at auction. And um, Art like this cracks me up just because if you bought it as, a, as an art person, what would you do? Set this up in your giant living room of your yeah, mansion? Well, it's, uh, it, it was owned by Saatchi himself and he actually had a special room with it in it, in his house. Um, anyway, when it went up to Edinburgh, um, the curator up there, uh, Alistair Elliott, I think his name was, was talking, I think in The Guardian or one of our broadsheet newspapers about how they, they found other stuff that people had chucked on the bed whilst it had been on exhibit. Yeah. Um, and like they found an additional, like odds and sods, you know, bits of litter had been thrown on there, but they also found like a note from somebody saying how much this work had really moved them. Well, I, I, I was gonna say, I was wondering where you were going with that because there's, there's an argument to be made. And I think you could make this argument being, you know, Sandy, that, that, I don't know <laughs> that, that, that 
that you could say, oh, well, this is the audience at, like in, inviting themselves into the story of the piece of art and therefore that's only adding to the art. And then there's other people who would say, well, that's disrespectful because you know, the people were putting this on the art of this person. Well, I mean, two, um, two topless artists leapt onto the bed and started having a pillow fight. Well, that's just... They deliberately went, and I think it was when it was... I don't know where it was at the time. Uh, and they called it In Bed with Tracy Emin. See, this is where performance art becomes anything. My life is, I was, I was gonna tell you this later, but I'm gonna tell you now. My life, since I can remember being conscious about it, has been one performance art piece. <laughs> and I would like to be paid $4.6 million as an NFT in Ethereum, please, for it. Okay. But go ahead. You can talk to your friends on Clubhouse about that, Bill. Um, I've never actually been on Clubhouse, but go ahead. Oh, that's awful. Um, <laughs> Right, I'm going to just say something. I've got a quote, and I think it's it's very relevant. You know, I, I'm talking again, coming back to the title, thinking about this idea of trial and tribulation. Trial because women are put in the dock to be judged, whether they are the artist or whether they're female artists making work about, again, I'm going to use the phrase female concerns, whether those female concerns are considered mainstream enough, which is a very bizarre concept, seeing as, of course, anything female is mainstream. Um, uh, there are lots of things in this ab about the, the kind of quality of, of confessional art as well. And I know that in an interview, Emin was asked about whether her art was an actual fact confessional art and whether she liked that. And she said something like, um, I say something and it's considered to be a confession. I'm not confessing that I had cancer. I'm not confessing that I've got a urostomy bag. I have had cancer and I have a urostomy bag. It's a statement. Yes. So sometimes there's this interesting uh, kind of occurrence where women make work that expresses something about their experience, their thoughts, their feelings. And it may not be a uniquely female experience, but it could be. Let's say it's it's a let's say it's a piece about menstruation, just for argument's yep. sake. Yep. And somebody comes along and says, "Oh, isn't it marvelous? This kind of confessional quality about the work." It's not confessional. We don't need to confess to something. It's a statement. It's a statement of yes. fact. This but, bed but that is fact. But that is that is people doing third party commentary on the art. That is not the artists themselves. This is the problem that I have with people writing about art or frankly, even us talking about art. You know, I'm very much a, a primary uh, uh, hearing her quote or hearing what I think about my own photograph or your own photographs or any of these people we talk to or, or now you've talked to Agnes Toth and, and you know what she feels about her thing after you and I talked about it for two hours. There is, all of that is very interesting to me, but in the end, are those people discussing it after the fact, adding anything that wasn't there to begin with? Or are no, they just think, obfuscating it and making it more complicated? No, I think, um, I think there, there is a role for a critic, but perhaps the, role of the, perhaps the role of the critic isn't to be critical, is simply to observe and through observing, inquire, encourage an inquiry. Well, I hope that's well, what you, you and I do. You know, I hope you and I don't batten down the hatches and make people think that our way or my way or your way of seeing something is the way. Yes, definitely not my way. Um, <laughs> the, the, my question is though, that you, you, you said the word judged a number of times in the, in the last uh, little thing you said. Do you, do you think that male artists are not judged? I wonder if they're judged by the same meter stick, the same criteria. Same standards. The standards against which we tend to measure women is still hanging over from something sure. that's before our time. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I just, I don't, I, any marginalized community 
we could talk yeah. about this as a thing. I mean, I've chosen to focus on the trials and tribulation really of female. Yeah. And I do have a problem truthfully myself with art that is female art because I don't seek to diminish female art, but I would hope that we soon reach a point where we no longer have to say whether something is female art or not. It's simply art. Yep. But I also am aware that that's hopefully idealistic and I'm saying that from a position of privilege in which I don't feel necessarily marginalized because of my femaleness. I, I you know, it's, it's interesting because I don't read art criticism. I don't, God, ever. Uh, you know, if you and I are talking about it and you quote something, I would never read the art section of the New York Times and see what the art person thought about some new painting, you know, some some new show at some gallery in Chelsea. Would never do it. It has zero interest in me. Would I go see those paintings if I was there? Sure. Do I give a crap what Joe Schmo or Anna, you know, Schmo thinks about them? No. It's irrelevant. It's what I think about them. That's the only thing that really matters to me. What do I care what they think about them? They can they can think what they want, but the idea that what some critic says, or what a you know what a chunk of male Britain or America or world thinks about some woman's art and somehow that denigrates that art, who gives a like the but hell with those guys? There is a sense that by encouraging kind of discourses around art, we are learning for ourselves and it doesn't yes, mean but, learn from the you... critic what to think i'm not learning that from the critic but i am then engaging with an inquiry that that critic might um sort of prompt for me and that's yeah, where i, I think the value yeah. of it is i i i tend to have a much more um uh uh I tend to view the critics as self-serving, you know, know-it-alls who are just trying to get more notoriety. I don't think that most, especially if I listen, you know, music criticism, ugh, you know, what some music critic thinks about, you know, Billy Joel's 52nd Street, I don't care because it's a great record. Doesn't matter to me. Like the, you can say what you want. There are plenty of fantastic records that have been completely panned and plenty of records that got five stars that I've listened to and thought, you think this is a good song? This mm. song is terrible. But so, hang on, Phil, just a second. Yeah. Uh, I don't mean to be rude, but I'm sure that if you had a fantastic write-up somewhere about your yeah. photographs, you'd yeah. be very glad of it. Uh, I'm sure I would. I mean, people have said nice things about my photographs, but I don't think I have any quotes by those people on my website. You know. Um, no, but but you are good at remembering good things that have been said about your work. Yeah, but, uh, yes, but usually just, but th they don't really change the way I feel about my work. I still think all my work is crap. No, but um, let's look at this just a little bit more, uh, which is sure. that though it doesn't change the way you feel about your work, you do understand the agency in it. Sure, that something. it could change how other people feel about my work. Yes. But, but, but I still think that all of that is a bunch of, you know, echo chamber BS that, I mean, it's sort of a necessary, it's the same way that social media is a necessary evil and how many followers I have matters. It's, um, it's, it's in that sort of area of life. I think I, I think I'm feeling a bit disgruntled because I see that actually you and I have a regular slot and we talk to each other about art. And it's not just that I see no harm in what we do, but actually I understand that the thing we do is, there I say it, purposeful. Yes, but you and I are not doing this for any self-aggrandizing purposes. We're doing it because we think we have something interesting to say and we enjoy each other's company. So I think, I think the first part of that is a self-aggrandizement. So. I would say that we, we enjoy each other's company mostly, although frankly, right now I could bring your neck. Um, <laughs> but I do want to come back to this idea that, you know, we are critiquing this work. Yeah. 
we are bringing information that's funneled through our sense of this work. And yet I can sprinkle it with a few facts that frankly, anybody could find out if they did a, mm -hmm. a kind of cursory glance at you know, a few articles. But the fact is, is that through our criticism of what we see, I don't think we're seeking to change other people's minds about what they see. Um, and what are we trying to do? But maybe we're, we're hoping to enter a space of inquiry and that that's the, that's the promotion. <laughs> that's the promotion, people. Two for one on inquiry. Take a good look. Really understand how you feel about what you see. Take time with what you see. Don't be complacent with it. So if I was to instruct anything ever, it's not to instruct you to see a particular thing, but it is to see. Speaking of seeing. Mm. What value that has simply, I think, is that we learn more about ourselves through these kinds of engagements. I, I, you and I are not on different sides of the table. We're just speaking at it from different angles. W what I'm saying is, I think we can have conversations about the, the things that, the terrible things people have said to these female artists in this case mm. about their work. And to some extent, that is just, those, those people's opinions that have those opinions for stupid societal, misogynistic, gender crazy, anger, hate, whatever, all these things Yes, they exist. Yes, they affect these people's lives. But those are not, those don't get the art anywhere. They don't push the whole conversation forward. No. That's just a lot of, it's like a lot of people shouting from the back of the room so the people in the front of the room can't be heard. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, I so, mean, the thing is, is that, you know, there's lots of arguments to be made about whether, you know, simply, is this work shit? It's got nothing ab to absolutely. do with it. It's got right, nothing but to do with being by a female artist about absolutely, concerns. and I'm happy to have that conversation and say I don't particularly like either of these pieces. Fine. But it has nothing to do with the fact that the people are are female who made them. No, but I do wonder again, just going into it, and again, I'm not saying this is you, Bill. I am saying yeah. just generally that we need to look at this: is that when people dismiss this work, are they taking the time to really see what's there? Are they dismissing the work because it's about something they don't understand? Sure. Are they dismissing the work because the language is something that is so, and rather ironically, refined that it is lost in the translation between something that is apparently very lowbrow and yet is actually high art? Do you think that these two artists The, the 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 fervor that surrounds art like this mm. do you think that they know that it's going to cause fervor and they're they're betting on it they're using that as an accelerant i i think uh if not the artists themselves and i think sachi charles sachi for example does an amazing job of scooping up new art new talent so to speak and transforming it from something that would otherwise be maybe forgotten in a minute to something that has a longer lifespan and a greater value. And I am talking a kind of fiscal, a financial value. Sure. This work, however, I would say that the, the Emin work has a value in all, all approaches of what I think of as a contemporary art paradigm Historically, it will fit in not just a, a young British artist YBA movement. It will actually fit into, you know, kind of, I, I don't like using the word intersectional because it's overused, but there's yeah. so many things that come from this work and come to this work in this one place. And let's not forget in 1998, when this was kind of incepted, it was not 
uh, you know, you had other artists like Sarah Lucas, and of course, more sort of further back still, Judy Chicago, all these names in what I would think of as feminist art, um, who were leading us to this point. But I'm not sure this is feminist art. Yet I think the reaction to it treated it, it as if it was an aggressive feminism. Yes, I, 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 I understand. Sorry, finish your thought. Mm, I can't remember. I, I just think that if you sat these people down and it was two in the morning and it was after a party and you're all just hanging out and you had them on a couch and they were talking to you with complete honesty because you like, you know, you got their trust. They would admit to you that they think that the controversy surrounding their work is a good thing for their work and that they they push for that controversy. So to I, I'd, I'd be willing to bet money that that's true. Well, I don't, I don't think either artist would ever claim that they shy away from controversy. Right, but at the same time, to, 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 to make art that you know is going to cause a reaction to a bunch of right-wing idiots, th then you get that reaction and then you say, how dare society for trying to take us down? It's like, well, you know, you, you kind of said, come on, punch me, come on, punch me. And then the person punches you and they go, well, why did you punch me? It's like, well, because you wanted them to punch you because it's better for you. I just, I don't necessarily trust people's uh, intentions all the time. I'm, I'm very cynical when it comes to that kind of thing, <laughs> you know? All right, so go ahead. Now we're jumping back to 1610. So we definitely can't get this uh, artist on the phone. No. Artemisia Gentileschi. I think this artist is fabulous. Mm -hmm. mm, a Baroque painter doing what Baroque painters do when they do things really well. Um, this is her first recorded painting. So this is still when she's probably, I think she's about 17 when she made this. Um, Kid's got some skill. It does. I mean, you know, there's parity with Caravaggio and actually her Judith beheading Holofernes is by far and away the better version. In fact, she painted many iterations of that. Um, and I now sound like an art history teacher when I'm speaking in this way, but <laughs> I want to just point out something that, again, many people watching this will perhaps already know, and that is that Artemisia is famed for her fantastic art, thank goodness. But also she is very well known as having made a successful case um, about her rape uh, by a fellow artist when she was only a year after this painting. So when she was 18, her father was a very uh, well-regarded artist as well. And in actual fact, sometimes uh, we might read about them sort of together Padre e Filia, or Filia, I can't remember how to say it, but there's lots of examples where they perhaps exhibited together. She was a precocious talent. She was um, obviously unusual because she was allowed the luxury of painting as a young girl. Um, her mum died when she was 12. She spent most of her time around men, um, but she chose throughout her life, and I'm jumping about a bit in this history about Artemisia a little, she did have a relatively long life and she did paint for the entirety of her life and she was very well regarded. In fact, she had a, an international clientele. As a female artist in the early 17th century, that is extraordinary. She is the exception. But the reason why I mentioned the story is that that story of her rape, um, I want to say has overshadowed her talent because it seems to have happened that uh, it somehow qualifies her talent. Now, what do you mean? Well, lots of people consider her to be a proto-feminist because of- Wait, wait that, that, that she's only remembered because of the case and not because of her, or her art is only remembered because of the case, that kind of thing, is that what you're saying? Yes, because lots of people think that there's a sort of, um, you know, there's a kind of vengeance theory in what she does, because when she paints, she does tend to paint these very powerful female leads and they are usually in some way thwarting 
or will ultimately thwart in the fables they represent uh, male the, the yeah. male power. So that's fine. But the fact is, is that again, there's a sense that the qualification of this work comes through that horrific act of violence that was committed against her. Now, um, this painting is the first painting, as I said, that's recorded by Artemisia. This is a year before that dreadful event occurred and it's Susanna and the Elders. And I don't know if you know the story of Susanna. I do not know if I know this one. Okay, so Susanna- This, this, is, my, this is my wife's uh, uh, call to arms is all this sort of stuff. Go ahead. Okay, so Susanna um, was apparently a very, very beautiful and lovely young wife and very modest. And uh, she chose to bathe in her garden and she'd sent people away. She wasn't making a spectacle of herself. And again, just listen to the language I'm using to tell the story because I think that in itself speaks another story. Um, so she wasn't being vulgar and she sent the, 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 the maids away. Anyway, there were two elders who had been visiting her husband and they spied her. They should have left the grounds and they didn't. They saw her disrobing and they both thought she was very beautiful and they conspired to get sexual favors from her. And when she resisted them, they threatened her with a lie. And in fact, they accused her of having had an adulterous um, relationship with a gardener or something, which at the time for her would have been punishable by death. Um, so these two elders basically wanted her to have sex with them. When she said no, they made up a story about her. Anyway, the long and short of it is that Daniel comes along and he doesn't want there to be any suffering of innocence. And so he champions Susanna and he cross-examines the two elders. And of course they give, you know, contradicting accounts of where they saw this act of adultery taking place and so on. Anyway, the reason why I put it in with trials and tribulations, one is that of course there's the trial, the unnatural trial that Artemisia herself did go through. And though I said, I don't want to overshadow her painting with that story about her own life circumstances. The fact is it is a fascinating story to have about one of the only female painters we know about. It doesn't mean there were not female painters. Of course, we all realize that, but the fact is that she was well-known, well-regarded. She was commissioned frequently. She was, as I said, an international clientele. She was well connected but she was painting always about these stories of females who face the scrutiny of others because of their gender females who come under fire females who are cast in doubt and in shame and even though this painting might seem in some ways triumphant because of the way the story pans out and of course these two scheming elders they themselves are then punished um, in, in, the, in the story. But the fact is it's Daniel, another male, who has to champion Susanna for her to survive. Sure. In the same way that there's a connection here. Hi, Paul, can you come over? I'm really frightened. Now that is a dreadfully poignant thing for anybody to utter. But the fact is, is that we have a princess, enormous privilege, asking for Paul, her butler, yeah. an, implicit, an implicit sense that there's the necessity of a hero. Now for Emin, and this is also why, frankly, I love Tracy Emin and people who hate her. I, I want to always try and understand others, but I can't understand why people hate her so much. I think she's amazing. Um, she's not asking to be saved. She's just asking us to look. Now, Artemisia, very special, but there is a sense that in every story that was available to her at her time, was always punctuated by a savior 
a male savior. And even though she painted strong women, and even though she's considered to be a proto-feminist, that's not diminished. But the fact is, is that the stories that were available, as I said, were all about something good coming from male power, even though the bad part comes from male power too. It's wait, it's interesting that you say I don't I didn't know the stories about her or anything that happened to her. So when I look at that painting, mm. I just see somebody and think, wow, this person really understands proportion and shadow and like that 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 it's funny because sometimes you see paintings and you think, oh, those you know, heads were painted after the bodies. You know what I mean? You know, when you can sometimes look at old stuff and you think, oh, those proportions aren't quite right or whatever. It's like, this is lovely and perfect. Well, it's I, right, but, but what's interesting about it is that not knowing anything about her, I'm just judging her on the proficiency of her paintings and how lovely it is, you know? Interesting so, words. What's that? I lovely? Just just wonder, you know, sometimes we're not conscious of these things, are we? But it's so telling. The words we use. You, you've called me on the use of the word lovely before, but I do use it with men and women. I like the word lovely. It's that's not a loaded term. Mm -hmm. Is that what the word you were going to you were commenting on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just I guess what I'm saying is that some people would say well, what we need to do is judge them on their work that they made and what they were trying to say by it and all the rest of it and not by the circumstances of their life. And in this case, having been raped and going to court and all the rest of it, that case, that that is irrelevant. I knew nothing about those things, but I was judging this work very highly just upon the work. In some ways, is it the way that I'm looking at this, the way that people would want somebody to look at that work, to judge it on its own merits. Mm -hmm. And and okay, I'm just saying that it's, it's interesting that I didn't automatically start assuming things based upon a sexual assault case that, that happened literally 500 years ago, uh, you know, 400 years ago. Um, I just see the work as the work. I think there's a lot of people who do. You know. In the work itself, though, and the story of Susanna, the story, the story is the story. The story is a symbol. I mean, technically, the painting, you're talking about a technical proficiency, something that visually um, is, you know, draws you in, perhaps. There's an amazing twist in her body, um, a lovely fleshiness to her as a nude study, for example, yep. and then this omnipresence, the two figures above the huddle that weights sure. her down. It's very, it's very clever. And also it's vertical. So, you know, in paintings of this period, you would normally find wider canvases uh, with a kind of greater range across a horizontal yep. Whereas this, with this, we actually like have a, a dark lot. storm cloud over the top of them. Yeah. Yeah, we have a lot of horizontal reading, but we actually are, are working in a vertical plane. So we're thinking about how that energy is funneled down the way onto Susanna. And bearing in mind, you know, Artemisia would have been 17 when she painted this. Yes, but at the time, you know, uh, myths and stories were a very common subject of painting yeah you know so it's not like she was well, going out on a limb by doing that well no uh but what i would say is that for example i mentioned already she painted maybe seven in iterations of judith beheading her law um and there is kind of parity between her painting and Caravaggio's very famous painting. I think he made two versions. Uh, both, I think, you can see at the Uffizi in Florence. Um, it's a hack museum. That's a bunch of junk there. Oh, it's just so glorious. 
I know. It's not, actually, you know what's nice about the Uffizi? It's not so big that it's overwhelming like the Louvre or even the Met are. It's big, but you can go through it and not walk out feeling exhausted and feel like you missed half the stuff. Mm. Anyway, go ahead. I don't know. can't remember. Anyway, I thought I'd show it here because yep. we've got different layers then of trials and tribulations. I um, plan to look up more of her work later. You'll, you'll really like it, Bill. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure I will. This is the kind of stuff I like. Look at all those American bills. Does American money look weird to you? No. Or because it's so common in TVs and movies that it's, it doesn't look weird. Yeah, it's so ubiquitous. Overused. Yeah. Okay, so we've got Liz Taylor. Kathy Burkhart made a whole series about Liz Taylor becoming like uh, almost this signal, this siren figure. A representation of uh, you know a champion of women that don't necessarily fit the criteria of like a mainstream ideal of womanhood somebody who is a diva and somebody who is difficult somebody who's gorgeous and amazing and challenging and flawed could you say similar to Lady Di yes yeah, so again I had hoped to curate in this little slideshow something that would hang together nicely, nicely, like lovely. Um, but Hell to Pay, it's Cat on the Hot Tin Roof, obviously the original play is Tennessee Williams, but we know Liz Taylor, I think it was 1958, maybe something like that. This The movie version came out with Paul Newman Oh my goodness, it is sizzling. I don't know if you've seen it. I have not. Um, she is a really complicated character, but actually Liz Taylor as an icon and a character in our contemporary culture is flawed and gorgeous and majestic in all her most challenging aspects, I would say. And I think here, what is being called up again, similar to, uh, actually similar to everything we've maybe already looked at is this sense that there's a horrible judgment to be had about women, about judging that book by its cover. And when a cover is the cover of Liz Taylor, then what do we really see? What do we really see when we look at Princess Diana? What do we really see when we see a nude? Much as this is a classically beautiful nude, it is a classic nude study of female. Okay, but th that is interesting, but you're, you're, I feel like you're arguing both that there's a superficiality to a set of armor that some women have put around themselves in projecting themselves in a certain way, like mm. Liz Taylor would. You know, Liz Taylor in the movies or Liz Taylor, the actress out in the world is not the Liz Taylor you would have at two in the morning sitting on a couch talking to you honestly. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you're also claiming that a woman completely devoid of any clothes is also not actually that woman. Am I? I'm, I'm asking. That's, it, it feels like that's what you're implying. No, I think all I'm suggesting is that we've got we've got symbolic forms. Oh, that's yeah, that's true. And I mean, in this case, you're she's literally been painted in black and white. Um, we are symbolic form. Yes. Well, I think everything and everybody is to some extent. You know, there oh, are archetypes do, and stereotypes for a reason. I do wonder about it. You know, there's nothing so reproduced maybe yeah 
in the female form. Yes. And it's, here it's, we it's have. It's better looking than the male form, by the way. I always find that such a bizarre thing when people say that. You know, it's funny though, if you talk to a lot of women that I've ever asked about it have said, I'd much rather look at a nude female than look at a nude male. And most men would probably say that for obvious sexual reasons. So, you know, you, you, don't, you don't think that one form is more aesthetically pleasing than the other? I think each form has its own authority. Okay. And the yes, you're right. The female form is beautiful, but you could, I could take that into all form has the potential to be beautiful. Sure. And, and there are various qualifications, I think, that anybody listening might start already thinking about putting on to that statement. Like we, we say female form is beautiful, it's aesthetically pleasing. Well, actually, hang on a second. That's not really the entirety of what is meant. It's a very particular female form that is beautiful. Sure, but that, but that, that even is, that particular form has changed over the years. Yes, it has, but it does not mean that there are not huge and grotesque limitations put onto the understanding of that form by our social conventions and that those social conventions are restrictive and limiting and divisive. Who's creating those, so, who's creating those social restrictions? Who's, who's, where, where do they come from and how do they propagate? Is there a committee? No, I'm, I, like, I, I seriously think about this kind of stuff a lot, especially when it comes to, you know, people would say, oh, Vogue magazine, it's terrible because look at this picture of women that, that they're creating and forcing on women. You know who edits Vogue magazine? Women. You know who buys Vogue magazine? Women. Mm -hmm. So like, so whose fault is it that that, that stuff is that way? I, you know, I didn't vote or put money towards it. I don't necessarily agree with it, but you know, I don't know that it's, I don't know that it's as nefarious as people make it out to be. Hmm. I love the word nefarious. That's first. Uh, That's next, word. I would say that though there might be an alignment with those values, when we do look at where the values come from, um, the values might come in part from women, for women, but it's about how the signals get jumbled up between who, who a woman is, dare I say it as an individual, and how a woman believes herself to be a woman. Yep. Mm, I'm trying not to be too obscure. I think we're getting very hey, obscure here. But 35 million people, 35 million women in America voted for an accused multiple rapist. You know, it's like at a certain point, it's like, I, I don't even know anymore. <laughs> so it drives me crazy. It's like some people are self-flagellating, it feels like. Really drives me crazy. I think the women we're looking at now, both as yeah. artists and as subjects, are all somehow in the dock. Okay, keep going with that. I feel that when art as an expression speaks to us of um, figures of um, almost like a downtrodden suffering, that it's very easy to see something of almost like a well, a worldview or certainly a Western view of what a bad woman might be. Sure. And the morality of any of the women 
whether they are in the painting or somehow enmeshed within the work, be it installation, painting or anything. And then the female artists and how we receive what they're telling us is maybe a little skewed by how our culture tells us to understand what it means to be a woman. And of course, yeah. that understanding is available to men as well. I do I, wonder I about this, like what is the male understanding of what it is to be a woman? And of course, such a generalization in itself is really, really divisive and can be really toxic in terms it of- It is, but, but, but even, even, in, even if, you, if you asked men how they view dangerous woman say liz taylor in, in this sort of realm right she's dangerous mm. and newman himself is dangerous man a dangerous man is sexy to a man a dangerous woman is probably sexy to a man a dangerous man to a woman is probably still sexy a dangerous woman to a woman is a threat you're going to take my man away from me that kind of you know weird crazy cultural stuff It's interesting. It's it's the, the way, I mean, it all comes down to very deep alligator brain. I was gonna stuff, say, I'm I not think. even sure if it is to do with culture, what you've just said. I, th I think it's I think it's I think it's really primal survival instinct stuff going on. And that it manifests itself in this multi-layered cultural levels of, you know hatred and misogyny and fear and anger and all the rest of it. But, you know, yes, society propagates this stuff and, and it, it rolls over and kids learn from their parents and all that stuff is true. But I think that there is also a, um, a big part of the driver is innate in humans. And so I, you know, it's, I mean, we're also talking about this from really kind of heteronormative perspectives, aren't we? But I do want to also draw attention to the fact that each of these women in some way is opening up a vulnerability that perhaps is particular to their femaleness or not. I'm really frightened. You know, a man yeah, can be frightened, but sure. can you come over? I'm really frightened. You know, we somehow see that anyway as a very female um yeah but also but in the in the lady die situation i mean if you know a lot of people talk about relationships on a power dynamic level mm. between lady die princess lady die and her butler who has the power in that situation but isn't it ain't the butler no no hang on a second there is that sense that even though she is the princess, yeah, her butler has the power. Now, only healthy. because he has more physical power. Uh, well, only because he's stronger and could fight people off. You know, that's. I mean, and but that gets back to the weird lizard brain stuff. Hell to pay. You know, we know that in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Brick yeah. is due to inherit loads of money from Big Daddy. And we see a woman who is skulking about on the periphery of what everybody wants or expects her to be. Perhaps the suggestion would be because she knows that ultimately she has married into wealth or potentially she will get some kind of financial compensation for what we come to see as a, a sexless relationship with Brick. Yep, yep. Mm, hell to pay the fact is like what do we give up you know there's all kinds of stuff here about you know virgins and whores are we selling out are we selling ourselves what are we selling to or buying into and as Se -se security versus love These women are challenged, I feel, by the expectations put on them because of their gender. Now, the only one who kind of gets away with that is Emin, because as I yeah. said before, 
she's not looking for the white knight, although we do understand from the context of that work that she's in that bed feeling so depressed because essentially of a man. You could argue the guy who, you know, who she broke up with was the white knight two years ago and, you know, and now isn't. Anyway, we're going to finish with this one. Sarani. There was a bit, there was a little bit of crossover. This painting is from just after Artemisia would have died in the, in the 1650s. There's a bit of debate about when she actually did die or where sure. she died. Um, some speculation she died from the plague in Naples in the 50s, 1650s. Anyway, Elisabetta Serrani, another interesting character. Her dad was a painter. She grew up and lived in Bologna, which is a very progressive city in Italy. Um, has a really great, has one of the first um, surgery theaters in the whole world is in Bologna. And I desperately want to go there because I saw it on a James Burke Connections show when I was a kid. I love Bologna. It's a beautiful city. I love James Burke and Connections. So I, we're on the same page. Um, so I've, Portia I've, wounding I've her thigh. blown through in a train. Go ahead. Portia wounding her thigh. Again, these references, if people aren't aware, Portia was the second wife of Brutus, who assassinated, or was one of the assassins of Caesar. Mm. And here she is. This is a fascinating painting. I mean, one, Serrani again, one of those anomaly characters in art history, female, a Baroque painter. Um, just a couple of them managed to get through the net. Um, prolific painter, really, really liked again, coming back to these very, what I would think of as strong female leads in her paintings. Um, anyway, Portia, do you know the story of Portia? I don't, no. So, um, the, by the way, we need, we need more strong female leads in myth in general. Somebody needs to write some myths with, you know, women well, who are not saved. Again, even even in Susanna, you know, the, the fact is, is that ultimately there's like a, a male hero yeah. at the end. So it's a shame because we don't follow through the full fable or story to find that that strong female right. necessarily gets her own credit. Um, anyway, Portia was aware something was going on with Brutus. And of course, he was plotting to assassinate Caesar, but he didn't tell her what was going on. This is so the story goes. And so she wondered how she could prove to him that she was so trustworthy. And she knew that were he to be caught in whatever he was planning or she may be captured and tortured to try and reveal some truth. And so she wanted to test herself to see what she could suffer. And so she cut her thigh with a dagger. Now in, the kind of semiological value of the painting you know there's lots of lots of things going on I mean a dagger is actually a symbol of masculine or masculinity in Roman culture so the fact that she wields it and she draws it right down obviously in that line to meet the blood on her leg there's so many um, little ticks and tricks in this painting that are very very clever um, but the fact is, the story is that she wanted to inflict pain on herself to see how much she could take before she crumbled. And apparently she was very ill. She bled profusely. Brutus came to her and said, my darling, what's the matter with you? And she explained what she'd done. And he was so moved by this that he realized he could really trust her. Now, what an extraordinary thing that a woman proves herself to her husband by inflicting such harm and to go to such lengths in order to make herself worthy. And by the way, also in the painting, in the background, we've got this symbol of masculine Rome in the dagger, but in the background, we've got these women who are living out what I would think of as a stereotype of female Roman culture, which is sure. the, the kind of the chatting and you know, the, I think they're meant to be spinning fabric spinning. or whatever the hell they're doing. Yeah. So you've got a juxtaposition between masculine and feminine, but the fact is that that masculine element is 
kind of carried out by this strong female. But isn't it interesting though that you that that bravery is seen by even by you in your description as a masculine element? That she is in the other room away from the females, being more manlike mm -hmm. by proving herself to her husband. So I mean, we all have our own, you know, those stereotypes have such strength. Exactly. And it's like yeah. earlier telling you to really pay attention to the language I was using yeah. and me picking you out for things like using the word lovely. We are utterly enmeshed in our cultural codes and whether we like it or not, yeah. we fall into the easy traps of these stereotypes all the time. There's an inevitability to it. And it's not just because of laziness, but we do have to pay attention to it. And do, so, do you feel like though that, that, that if I saw this painting though, and I saw this woman, and I was there at the time, with today's, you know, thinking, I would think she needs to go see a psychologist who talks about cutting because this woman obviously has, you know, some things going on that have nothing to do with her trying to prove herself to her husband. So it's so funny how, over time, even the actions of people in a myth or in a story or in a painting or the way they, the the way things happened decades or centuries later, the interpretation within the society could be completely different. Mm. Nonetheless, I would get still the feeling that she was somehow holding herself to account. Do you think that she's brave for having done this? Or do you think she's psychologically challenged for having done this? I think she's putting herself on trial. She's testing herself. That's all I think. Hmm. In the first instance, I think she's testing herself. And yes, of course, there's an obvious sense in modern culture, we would say, oh, you know, self-harm, quick, whisk her off to some psychiatrist somewhere. But yeah, get her all fixed up. I was being sarcastic. Mm -hmm. We are so lazy when we talk, when we think. And actually it can feel exhausting and overwhelming to constantly be in the woke zone. Sure. Um, but I do feel we ought to try. <laughs> It's interesting though, in this case, if this was painted by a man, would you still have the same interpretation of the female subject in it? Um, well, I mean, obviously I know this, the story of Portia. So the sure. fact that it is Portia wounding her thigh, like that is kind yeah, of but it would it, putting the text on the painting, Bill. Sure, but would it, but it, would it change the way you saw it if it was painted by a man? Would you, well, would you seek or come up with different interpretations of things that he had put in there that were different than the story or masculine elements that, that shifted things in a different direction of whatnot? I think what's interesting is that knowing that it's by a female artist at a time in which female artists were not uh, particularly well known or well regarded does make this painting more special for its content. Um, and actually, I think what's really interesting with Serrani, but also with Artemisia, is the way they paint, for example, fabric. Now, the, the, for a cursory glance, it might not be different much to the way that someone like Caravaggio paints fabric. However, what I would say is that we're used to women reclining as nudes and available flirts on all kinds of fabrics from similar periods in art history and all the way forward really till now. But there's something particular about the way that I think flesh is exposed. Hmm. I don't really want to go too much into this, but the way flesh is exposed and the way the fabric is concealing the body or covering the body is not about any false modesty. No, but there's also a certain salaciousness to her with her leg up, leg showing, holding this, 
you know, phallic symbol in her hand jabbing down into her into her thigh. I mean, this is like yeah, I there's, mean, there's all kinds yeah. of readings of this. I mean, you could sure you could have a field day in in sort of feminist studies with this painting. Sure. Yep. Um maybe even more so than Susanna. Yeah, I, I think so. I think there's more symbolism in the other. Anyway, Bill, we've talked for a very long time this evening, but I'm still not sure we've come up upon anything in particular. I think this is a this is a tough subject. It is really um, tough. I mean, I think that there are, I think that the thing that, I don't think you and I disagree that female artists have a different perspective or that female artists are often treated differently. Um, I think we agree on that. I just like, I like to tease things apart and say, you know, this element of what we're talking about is irrelevant to gender and this part has gender elements like that that it's not as it's not as cohesive to me as it is i think perhaps to you in the way that you think about it um but that's my thing is i like to you know break things into pieces to find where the fault lines are um could you tell me a fault line here no uh, and with that, everybody. <laughs> Next week, are you going to give me something easy? This is this is a hard one. No, I'm planning on making them harder week by week. Okay. So if we ever actually meet in person, I'm just going to be a, 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 you know, a shell of the person that I was before because I'm so downtrodden by uh, we can do speaking of seeing episode that's called what you once were. <laughs> it's just pictures of me in different states of disrepair. As long as it's not different states of undress, Bill. Anyway. Oh, God, no. See you soon. See you later. Bye, Sandy.